Ian Duncan Smith, MP, of course, former Conservative Party leader who joins us. Good morning to you. Morning, Julie. I was just listening to your interesting conversation just a second ago. <laughs> any, any thoughts on our conversation about Israel and uh, Hezbollah? Yeah, yeah, it was a circular conversation. I think for every answer you gave him, he had a question. Yes. So it was... <laughs> I, just, I wasn't sure we were getting about it. Let's talk about the, the wars at Tory party conference instead. Um, there's no doubt at all the Tory party leadership battle is actually bizarrely getting interesting, warming up a little bit. Um, certainly there's been a lot of focus on the two front runners, Kemi Page and August Ava, I think more of a slip of the tongue uh, rather than anything else, comments about maternity pay, but also Robert Jenrick uh, very much in the news uh, for some of the things he said, particularly today, uh, about um, about uh, uh, troops, uh, British troops. Now, um, he's made the, some interesting, interesting remarks about how basically British troops, he said, uh, in a campaign video, uh, he said... Uh, um, our special forces are killing rather than capturing terrorists because our lawyers tell us that if they're caught, the European court will set them free. It's been criticised by both Tom Tugendhat and James Cleverley, both with military backgrounds, for saying that. You also have an ex-military background as well. Uh, what do you make of what he said? Well, I, <clears throat> I didn't actually hear it myself, uh, and I'm not quite sure what he's indicating here because I wasn't aware that there was a an issue that was already live out there about whether or not people were capturing them rather than shooting them. I don't think, my personal view, I'm not always certain that that goes through a soldier's head is the idea that uh, he wants to avoid the, the court of human rights. So I think that, I'm not sure what, I just have no understanding how the basis for that debate took place. But mm. yeah. what I will say when you said earlier on it's getting interesting, I've always taken the view that I'm not looking for uh, ready-made policies, because that's an absurdity. You've got five years to go uh, for Labour go back to the polls. So what we need to be looking for is the character of the individuals that are standing. And I think debates about issues and principles are really what we should be about. And I think in many senses what Kemi was saying the other day, what he's now stirring up with others, far better to have those arguments and rows now to try and pick out who has a clearer view than to mosey along quietly as though nothing happened at the last election. It's just a matter of finding a replacement yes. for Rishi Sunak, which I have to say, silence is a disaster for us. What we do need is that debate. <laughs> well, well you, we you always said you put yourself forward as the quiet man rather than, rather than the silent man. A lot of people who are at party conference, which I'm, I'm delighted to say I'm not, and I feel I'm, a, I'm an equal opportunities conference loather, uh, whichever party is, is having their conference, um, that actually is surprisingly buoyant, and particularly after the Labour conference, which should have been a victory lap and turned into an absolute disaster uh, for Keir Starmer with all the conversations about the freebies and the gifts and the hospitality he'd accepted. Uh, but also criticism from the unions over the decision on the winter fuel payment uh, uh, being scrapped uh, for all pensioners. Um, you'd have expected Labour to be a victory lap, and it wasn't, um, and actually a lot of ra rows and recriminations, and expect the Tories to be miserable, but by all accounts it's rather uh, upbeat. Is that, is that what you're seeing? Well, I, I wouldn't call it completely upbeat. I would say that what people have a clear idea of is now what the challenge ahead for us, which is enormous and monumental. Um, but I do think there's something peculiar about this result of the last election, which takes some examination, which may be the answer to your question. We know that Labour has had the biggest majority on record, but with the lowest polling. So at 33%, to have got 170-plus seats is absurd. When you think Blair in 97 got, uh, and, and he got 44%, and he got less than that. And so you can see what this story is all about. No, no, 117 he majority. He, 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 they didn't get the big... Yeah, yeah, Blair had saying. 779, yeah, yeah, no, Keir Starmer's got 170 majority. Yeah, 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 but he's got a bigger majority than Blair got. My point is no, that Blair got that on a 44% no, vote. He hasn't, but it's, it's very similar, but exactly, it's a much higher vote. No, but that's the My thing. My point is, 10 points difference, and, yeah. and you're ending in the same territory is what I'm making. Yeah. And so that's where the issue becomes. And you can see that the Labour Party, therefore, has a problem because of what's been going on, but also because it's very uneasy in itself. So that erupts last week. So for the Conservatives now, their biggest problem is what do we do about that other party that was one of the biggest causes for our collapse and reform and that people deserted us completely. Mm. And dealing with that is really what people are talking about and should be talking about here. Is this a long-standing feature or is it a party that may yet pose a very significant challenge in the future yeah. to the Conservatives? And therefore, what are our principles and what are our foundation beliefs? 
that make a Conservative yeah. and make a Conservative Party well, that are different from uh, reform. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Because reform is certainly getting themselves organised. They've got some big donors. Uh, they are they are hiring people. They've got a massive influx of members. Um, you know, over eighty thousand now. That's probably not close to uh, what what, uh, what the Tories have. But who? Which of the party leaders? I know you've not formally declared yet. But which party leaders are you looking at? Because, in terms of the front runners. Uh, if we've been told for a long time, Kemi Badenoch is the front runner for Tory party members. Uh, hands down, a poll in in August suggested she was 18 points ahead of her nearest rival. But it's John, it's Robert Jenrick who has been able to uh, win the uh, the first two rounds of the Tory MPs ballots. And of course, uh, as we know, we see this again and again play out with uh, the Tory uh, party. You need to have uh, a leader who has the support of the majority of MPs. Um, but it now looks, according to latest polls, and again, difficult to poll a very small group of people like a few you know under 100,000 Tory members but suggest that Robert Jenrick has closed that gap to just four points um, James cleverly not that far behind uh, uh, in terms of sport Tom Tugnet trailing a bit behind which of those four candidates still in the race do you think has the best chance of taking the fight not just to Labour but also to reform UK well in point is where I think all of them have an opportunity to do that my reason for going quiet on this as I look at them is I'm looking for one fundamental thing. I'm not looking for people that can enunciate huge and detailed policies because I think that's a pointless exercise at this stage in the game. Uh, we need more time for that. But what I'm after is who do I think is going to develop as a leader to be able to command the space and be able to take the attack not just to Labour, which was the case when Blair was elected, but to take it now to the other fringe which is where Conservative voters yeah. decided to go in protest about us. And is it feasible for us to bring them back without trying to look like reform or pretend to be something else, but to give them the space to say, do you know what, this party's got its act together, the principles it believes in, the, the found, founding sense of who they're for and what they're against is becoming clear, and the individual looks like they can take the fight to all those who have taken our vote. And that's the key element for me, who's going to develop. Okay. And I still haven't made my mind up looking at this, and I'm waiting to see how this hops up. But I'm very pleased to see it hot up, because that's what I'm after. Yeah, well, it has gotten a little bit more interesting. It wasn't very interesting for quite a long time, let's be honest. Um, it's interesting, the migrant issue has uh, been rid, rid its head again yesterday. Uh, we've, we've had the extraordinary revelation from Labour that it turns out clearing that asylum backlog isn't magnificently easy to do just because Labour are in power. They're looking at migrants being stuck in hotels for three years at a cost of more than £4 million a day to the taxpayer, as opposed to being able to get them all out within a year. Also, Robert Jenrick has said that he believes the migrant crime rate is being covered up. He says he would publish details uh, about uh, people's uh, national origin in terms of the crime rate. We've seen that in Denmark, showing a much higher crime rate among people from North Africa and Middle Eastern countries, been off the scale different from other uh, rivals. James Cleverly has said that Tories should never have promised to stop the boats because they couldn't do it. And Kemi Badenoch has said that the Tories, if they were in power, should basically have a migrant cap and stick to it. There's no doubt at all this is going to be a big vote winner for whoever wins the leadership and indeed. Uh, for any Tory voters on the issue of migration. Do you think uh, any of any or all of those ideas, or none of them, are, are what will win over those voters who deserted the party last time round? I think most of the people that deserted us deserted us because we made these pledges before and then promptly ignored them. Uh, and that is our biggest problem. You know, to, it's, Forget about, for a second, illegal migration, which we know is an issue and a serious problem, but legal migration exploded. Uh, in the last few years. And that's not what we were elected to resolve. We were elected to get that so that those we needed would come over, but we would be very close on checking the numbers because it's the scale and the speed of migration that causes dissension and problems. So it's all well and good for individuals uh, who are standing to make these pledges. My point is, don't make the pledges. Tell us how you think this can be changed first because Labour came in on a stupid idea to get rid of uh, the Rwanda scheme and then say we're going to have debates with Europe. But Europe's yeah. mired in the same problem. Exactly. Why would they want to help us out when they've got many more migrants illegally coming into uh, to Europe? You can see this debate taking place everywhere. Absolutely. So that's our problem. Don't talk about what you will actually achieve. Talk about how you're going to achieve it and why it's going to be different and why it's going to be worse. Well, we'll see. We'll hear from two other uh, the uh, candidates today and, and, and others throughout the uh, uh, the rest of the uh, the conference. And, of course, that uh, big vote between them for MPs to narrow it down to two candidates taking place two different days next week. Sir so Smith, very much appreciate uh, you joining us, former Conservative Party.